The author visits the Lapland Alps, an extract from Lachesis Laponica by Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus, also known as Carl von Linnea or Carolus Linnaeus, is called the father of taxonomy. Till date, his system for naming and classifying organisms is in wide use. His principles of classification have wide impact upon generations of biologists, though some resisted the philosophical and theological aspects of his work. Born on May 23, 1707 AD in the province of Smallland in southern Sweden, Carl Linnaeus developed a deep passion for plants and a fascination with their names from a very early age. Though he was enrolled at the prestigious universities of Sweden as a student of medicine, most of his time was spent in collecting and studying plants. During his study period, training in botany was part of the medical curriculum for every doctor had to prepare and prescribe drugs derived from medicinal plants. Linnaeus undertook a botanical and ethnographical expedition to Lapland in 1732 and an extract from this account is prescribed for study in your course Ecological Concerns in Literature. Linnaeus acquired his medical degree in 1735 and that same year he published the first edition of his classification of living things, the Systeme Naturae. During these years, he collaborated with Europe's great botanists and continued to develop his classification scheme. He was interested in sending his students on trade and exploration voyages to all parts of the world. Nineteen of Linnaeus' students went out on these voyages of discovery. Linnaeus continued to revise his Systeme Naturae, which grew from a slim pamphlet to a multi-volume work as his concepts were modified and as more and more plant and animal specimens were sent to him from every corner of the globe. Despite failures, he experimented with foreign plants such as coffee, tea, banana, rice and mulberries if they could be grown in local climate and even tried to find out their substitutes, but he faced monthly disappointments. In 1761, he was granted nobility and became Carl von Linnea. His later years were marked by increasing depression and pessimism. After suffering a series of mild strokes in 1774, Linnaeus died in 1778, leaving a legacy of classification system to the world. Throughout his life, Linnaeus showed an interest in nature and the systems which govern it. He wrote not just about classification, but also about ecology, how organisms interact with their environment. He explored food chains and even defined the concept of race, dividing humans into four groups, Americanus, Asiaticus, Africanus, and Europeanus. The expedition to Lapland, the northernmost region in Sweden by Carl Linnaeus in 1732 is a milestone in his scientific career. His observations became the basis of his book Flora Aponica, in which Linnaeus' ideas about nomenclature and classification were first used in a practical way. Linnaeus' journal of this expedition was published posthumously as an English translation called Lachesis Laponica, a tour in Lapland, in the year 1811. In April 1732, Linnaeus was awarded a grant from the Royal Society of Sciences in Uppsala for his journey. Linnaeus hoped to find new plants, animals and valuable minerals. He was also curious about the customs of the native Sami people. Carl Linnaeus begins the essay by stating that the Laplanders are usually blear-eyed, that is, their eyes are tired, unfocused and watery due to many reasons. The chief reason, according to the author, is the sharp winds. The other reasons are the snow, the whiteness of which when the sun shone upon it, the fogs, smoke and the severity of the cold. During the author's journey with the interpreter in the Lapland, he describes how the repeated exposure to stormy weather, the blazing whiteness of the snow, 
the fog mist and the severity of the cold have made his eyes sore his eyesight troubles him so that he could not open them wide without an effort also he adds it is quite natural to be blear eyed when the smoke in the laplanders huts has no outlet but by the hole in the roof and consequently fills everybody's eyes as it passes because of the laplanders being blear eyed one might think that the word lappy that is laplanders was derived from lippy meaning blear eyed then Linnaeus proceeds on to describe the tents of the Laplanders. The Laplanders do not build huts. They live in tents. They construct tents with beams and warmint cloth. Four beams are erected in four directions and they are conjoined at the top in slanting posture. A solitary beam is placed on each side in the middle of the arch formed by these four so that the whole edifice has six angles. Then Slender sticks of same length are erected between every two angles are main ribs of the building. Then the whole structure is covered by wadmat cloth with a provision for entry point. The usual height of the tent is a fathom and a half, the breadth being two fathoms. One fathom equals two meters or six feet. The women wear belt ornamented with tin and silver embroidery and pearls. At times, several things such as leather bag and brass mugs are attached to the belt. The men wear a bag hanging down exactly in front. It has two pockets containing the tobacco pipe, tinder box, tobacco and a spoon made of reindeer's horn. The spoon is of a long flattish shape. The Laplanders use kettles and pots made sometimes of brass, sometimes of copper and rarely of stone owing to its weight. They do not have plates but use hemispherical bowls and oblong shaped step boats. Closely plaited circular baskets and tubs are used to keep cheese in. The skin of the reindeer with the hairy part uppermost is spread on the floor of the tent. There is a fireplace at the center and all other furniture are furnished at the back. There are two racks near the roof in which cheeses are laid to dry and towards the entrance there are rennet bags filled with milk preserved for winter use. As a defense against wind and snow, a sort of hood called the almifata is worn over the cap. It is made of red cloth of a shape of a truncated cone dilated at the bottom and is four palms high, three palms in circumference at the upper part and six at the bottom. This covers the cheeks as well as the neck and shoulders, the eyes and mouth only being exposed. In winter time, the women wear breeches made exactly like those owned by the men as well as boots though the latter come no higher than the knees. It is wonderful how they are able in the severity of winter to follow the reindeer which are never at rest but keep feeding by night as well as by day. They have indeed small sheds or huts here and there into which they occasionally drive their reindeer but with the greatest difficulty. When the reindeer are milked, the Laplanders clean the ducks of the reindeer with the milk already in the pail. Whenever it happens that one of the reindeer strays from its master's herd to that of a neighbor, the person to whom it comes milks it without any offense to the proper owner. Such an incident often happens, for these animals love society and the more of them they are together, the better they thrive and enjoy themselves. They are marked at the ears like cows that every person may know his own. Linnaeus then describes about an old woman whose countenance and dressing are altogether of the Lapland caste. He further observes that the husband, who is 36 years old, married her for the sake of her large herds of reindeer. When the Laplanders sit, they either cross their legs under them or one knee is bent, the other being straight. On July 17, Linnaeus and the interpreter arrive at the abode of Mr. Cock, the under bailiff. Here he admires the dark faced people. He spots lemming rats, which are called limic in Lapland. The body of these animals is grey. 
The face and the shoulders are black with very short tail and ears. They feed on grass and reindeer moss. They are not timid and look out from their burrows that are half a quarter of an L deep. An L equals 27 inches. They bring forth five or six at a birth. The herb gentian or centauri with a hyacinthine flower is found by Linnaeus. On July 18, Linnaeus gathers and examines the little catchfly which resembles the common one Lychnus viscaria. He observes its root, leaves, stem, flower stalk and flowers. On becoming thirsty, he follows the style of a Laplander who cuts out a lump of ice and sucks it by way of refreshment. The Laplanders could not understand Linnaeus' desire of washing his linen cloth because theirs is made of woolen cloth called Vadma. In winter, they wear Lapland boots which come up to the middle of the thighs. The boots used by women are below their knee. In winter, Laplanders wear the coat of the reindeer skin called Lapmut with the hairy side turned inwards and in summer they turn that side outwards. On July 19, Linnaeus gives an account of the little fly that frightens the herd of reindeer. Amongst a herd of 500 reindeer, the presence of only 10 of these flies causes chaos because of each reindeer's attempt to escape from that fly. While these insects fly, their tail protrudes and it consists of four or five tubular joints slipping into each other like a pocket spying glass. This insect causes spots on the reindeer skin. The Laplanders use a curious kind of box or basket which they call kisa for keeping or carrying various articles. It is of an oval form with the bottom and sides made of fur like a box being about a foot and half long, a foot broad and six inches deep with a transverse opening in the bottom to admit a part of the saddle of the reindeer. Two such boxes, each weighing about two pounds, are placed upon the reindeer for that animal cannot carry above four or five pounds weight and only the castrated males are used for this purpose. Against the sides of the pack saddle, the above described boxes or baskets are hung and fastened, the transverse chink in the bottom of each being fitted to the saddle. The Laplanders, both men and women, after borrowing a lighted pipe and passing it from one to another, retain a mouthful of smoke as long as possible that they may enjoy as much of the flavor as they can. Old men chew tobacco. The tendons in the legs of the reindeer serve to make thread or cord. The Laplanders lay hold of the tendons with their mouths, split and moisten them, rubbing them from time to time with reindeer marrow. Each string is made sharp at both ends and drawn through holes of various sizes in an instrument. In this part of the country, the ampitrum the birch and the willow are used as firewood. When the Lapland children are laid into the cradle, they seldom cry, although their hands are confined down to their sides. If they cry, it is generally from hunger. The cradle is placed in a sloping position so that the child's head is half upright. The bottom of the cradle is hollowed out of a piece of fir wood, consequently not very heavy. When the children are taken out of the cradle, they are dressed in a small garment of reindeer skin. They are able to stand on their legs by the time they are four months old and turn their head and eyes about with a degree of intelligence hardly ever seen in other children at that early age. Linnaeus concludes his account by saying that he never met with any people who lead such easy, happy lives as the Laplanders.